So since we uh, broached into chapter 7, the first six chapters deal with visions and dreams that somebody else has, most of which it was Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, but from 7, 8 uh, on, it's visions that Daniel has, that the Lord gives Daniel. And he shares those visions. They're, they're all very, very similar because they all deal with world-governing empires that are going to rise up right up until the time of the end. And so we went through all of that in a lot of detail. And you can go back and listen to those messages if uh, you want to refresh yourself. But tonight we're going to be looking at a, uh, a prophecy that really is so amazing. I find it amazing. Uh, as we go through it, I'll share it all with you. In chapter 9 and verse 1, it says, In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus. And now which Darius is this, Frankie? We don't know for sure. <laughs> I know she had that question with regard to the study in Haggai. But uh, nonetheless, this is Darius, the son of Ahasuerus of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king. He was made king, so uh, obviously he was appointed by someone higher than him, and it was probably Cyrus, who was higher than he, appointing him over that providence, which included Israel, who made king over the realm of the Chaldeans as well. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord given through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So this is in 539 BC where this begins to take place. Now, what is he talking about about these 70 years? That's how long they were going to be in captivity. As we start to look at these dates, uh, let's see, did you, what's that first slide you, you constructed for me out of my notes? Okay, let's go to Ezekiel chapter 4. Turn with me there. Ezekiel 4 gives us an understanding of the judgment that's coming upon Israel, the northern kingdom, and Judah, the southern kingdom. In chapter 4, beginning in verse 4, and you know, I was shared with you on Sunday, after I got saved, the first book I studied through was which? Ezekiel. Ezekiel. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> and Ezekiel is quite a colorful prophet, you know. He, uh, he had to act out his prophecies, and you really had to be trusting the Lord to do some of the things he did. But here he's asked in chapter 4, verse 4, Ezekiel, lie also on your left side and lay for the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it. According to the number of days that you lie on it, you shall bear their iniquity. For I have laid on you the years of their iniquity according to the number of the days. 390 days, so you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. So what is God saying there? That they're to bear, he's, he's to display how God has, has, has bared with them in their iniquity, in their sin. Sins, right? Sins are we miss the mark. Transgressions. We purposely walk over the line. That's a transgression. Iniquities. Your twisted, evil, wicked, rebellious heart. That's the difference. Sins, you've missed the mark. Transgressions, you've purposefully walked over the line. Iniquities is the heart problem. The heart is the problem, isn't it? The heart of the problem is the heart. Okay. So for 390 days, he's to lie. Boy, that would cause you to have to need a chiropractor after that, wouldn't it? <laughs> Lying on your side for 390 days for the iniquity of the house of Israel. Okay, now we're going to give you a break, Ezekiel. Roll over. And when you have completed them, lie again on your right side, and then you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Judah 40 days. I have laid upon you a day for each year. Therefore, you shall set your face towards the siege of Jerusalem. Your arm shall be uncovered, and you shall prophesy against it. And surely I will constrain you so that you cannot turn from one side till another till you have ended the days of your siege. Isn't that amazing? So he's prophesying, you know, the northern kingdom has already gone into captivity and that happened because of their transgressions, their iniquities uh, against the Lord. The Assyrians came in and destroyed the northern kingdom. Now he's prophesying the destruction of Judah and Jerusalem, the southern kingdom. So he's to lie on his side. How long? 430 years. That's a long time, isn't it? Yeah. Now, Jeremiah is indicating here in Jeremiah chapter 1 that there's a prescribed period of time in which God had purposed this 
captivity by the Chaldeans. What was that prescribed period of time? 70 years. Turn with me. Now, let's see. What's the next slide? What would you do there, Darren? There we go. Second Chronicles, chapter 36. Turn with me there. Thank you for staying true to my notes. Second Chronicles. These are the historical books. Chapter 36. This was the destruction of uh, Judah and Jehoiada, the last king, Zedekiah, is uh, taken into captivity. Uh, look at verse, uh, let's pick it up in verse 19 of 2nd, you there? Everybody there? 2nd Chronicles? Verse 19. Then they burned the house of God and broke down the walls of Jerusalem, burned all of its palaces with fire and destroyed all of its precious possessions. Then those who escaped from the sword he carried away to Babylon where they became servants to him and his sons until the reign of the king of Persia to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. As long as she lay desolate, she keeps Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. So why did, what, what Sabbaths, what are we talking about here? They were to give the land its rest, you see. They were to work the land for six years and in the seventh year they were to give the land its rest. Did they ever do that? No, never, not once. Why wouldn't they do that? Greed. 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 That's exactly right. So for 490 years, they never gave the land its rest. So what did they owe the land? 70 years. 70 years. They owe the land 70 years of rest. Now, Jeremiah prophesies the same thing. Go to Jeremiah 25. Verse 11 and 12 when you're there. Okay. Verse 11, chapter 25, the prophet Jeremiah declared, and this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon (coughs) 70 years. Thank you. 70 years. Verse 12. Then it will come to pass when the 70 years are completed that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation and the land of the Chaldeans for their iniquity, says the Lord. I will make it a perpetual desolation. Now, God is using a people far worse than his own to discipline them, to judge them. Judgment always begins where? In the house of the Lord. And it is amazing that God would use a people far worse than his own. He used the Syrians had a horrible reputation for their brutality, their torture, and the way they treated people. The Babylonians, not much different, a little better, but not much different. But surely they were, the the, the Israelites and the residents of Judea were far more law-abiding, righteous, than were the Assyrians or the Babylonians. Yet God used both of these evil empires to discipline his people. Would it be a surprise if God chose to use China to discipline the United States? Should be no surprise to us at all. And if you are aware of what is happening geopolitically, it's getting very exciting. From our perspective, if you're an unbeliever, it's getting very concerning. I won't get too political tonight. I'll try try to restrain myself. (laughs) Nonetheless, Daniel is prophesying this uh, 70 years. So if you go back to Daniel 1... I mean, verse, uh, yeah, Daniel chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. When was this? Why do I teach this class? You, you guys know what you're talking about already. I don't need to teach this class to you. So the siege of Jerusalem, of Judea specific, was in three phases, right? Three steps, right? There were three deportations of the Jews to Babylon. The first was when? 605 BC. Who was carried away in captivity then? 
Daniel and his three amigos, right? Mishael, Hanan, and Azariah. Now, 597 was the second deportation of the Jews back to Babylon. Who was deported then? It's not up there. Ezekiel. Ezekiel the prophet, he was deported then. He was carried away into captivity then. And then the last siege of Jerusalem by the Babylonians, 586 B.C., what happened then? The temple was destroyed, and they completely destroyed the city. So that's what had taken place there. Now, uh, the third deportation, as I said, happened in uh, 586 B.C., and the temple was ruined, was destroyed. The first deportation was what year? 605. It happened to be 605, the third month. Did I? Did you make a slide for that too? <coughs> My friend? Are you awake? It's later on in your, your math. Later on in my math. Okay, not according to my notes. The people were carried away in the first deportation, 605, the third month. So say 605.3, okay? How long was the captivity to be? 70 years. 70 years. So if it was a 70-year captivity from 605.3, what did that bring us to? Very good. You see? It's all up there, isn't it? Yeah. 535.3. The, the deportation would, had taken place, the judgment on Israel for 70 years because they did not give the land the rest just as God had foretold had occurred, right? When was the temple destroyed? If you take away 70 years from 586, what do you come to? And that's when the temple was rebuilt 70 years later. Isn't that amazing how precise our God is? You with me so far? Seven-year captivity, the people went. The people went to captivity. Six o five, their captivity ends at five thirty-five. The third month, the temple was destroyed in the last siege. Five eighty-six. Seven years later, the temple is rebuilt. When the Jews had gone back to rebuild the temple, it was completed there in five fifteen. Exactly seventy years later, isn't that amazing? Now, turn me to Leviticus twenty-six. What was the purpose for their deportation? What was it? To give the land its rest, but from God's perspective, what was he trying to do with his people? He was disciplining them. He wasn't condemning them. Condemnation is permanent. It's a judgment that is eternal. He was disciplined. Disciplining is to cause their hearts to turn. He wanted them. What's that Hebrew word for turning? Teshuva. He wanted them to make teshuva, to turn your heart, to turn your life back unto the Lord. The whole book of Jeremiah is really God asking them to return unto him. Right? Now, in Leviticus, he said, if you should rebel against me, if you should allow your iniquitous heart to take over your life, and if you don't turn, then I will judge you seven times for what you have done. So go with Leviticus 26, and we see that there. Everybody there? Leviticus 26? Verse 14, if you do not obey me and do not observe all these commandments, and if you despise my statutes, or if your soul abhors my judgments so that you do not perform all of my commandments but break my covenant, I also will do this to you. I will even appoint terror over you, wasting disease, fever, which shall consume the eyes and shall sorrow the heart. And you shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. And I will set my face against you, and you shall be defeated by your enemies. Those who hate you shall reign over you. You shall flee when no one is pursuing you, living a life of fear and paranoia because they had turned from the Lord. A lot of people are living in fear and paranoia today, aren't there? Yeah, we look at how uh, suicide is at an epidemic now. The number of people who are addicted to prescription drugs, the, the illicit drug use that's taken. I mean, it's, it's amazing how few, how few, how, let me, how few people can really cope with life without some artificial stimulant. Sad. Is Jesus not enough? Is his word not sufficient? Is this person not sufficient? Now, we talked about that on Sunday, too, didn't we? Relative to whose life? Uh, were anybody here Sunday? You were here Sunday. Okay. Well, Sunday, I mentioned to the group that was here, it was Maria. You know, Mary, Martha, Lazarus. 
Mary recognized that Jesus was her all in all. Hmm? Sat at his feet. Every time you see Mary, she's at his feet. She's, she's at the feet of Jesus. First learning of him. The second time casting her burdens upon him. The last time worshiping him. Right? As opposed to the other guy, who was that? Judas. And Judas saw Jesus as what? A means to an end. Hey, hey, listen. Nobody sells like Jesus does. That's <laughs> what... Doran Heiliger, the in-country guide in Israel, speaks five languages, knows the Bible probably better than most Christians, but he's not a believer yet, yet. I think he may be one of those Jews who comes to faith after we're raptured. <laughs> but he said, there's something special about Jesus for certain because nothing sells like Jesus here. <laughs> and so they're just simply merchandising, which is what Judas was doing. Hey, be careful. Be careful. There's a lot of people here claiming ministry and they're just merchandising Jesus. He's a means to their ends. He's not their all in all. But Jesus, I mean, uh, the Lord Jesus, God the Father, the Holy Spirit says through uh, Moses in Leviticus, verse 18, and after this, if you do not obey me, I will punish you seven times more for your sins. Verse 21, then if you walk contrary to me and are not willing to obey me, I will bring on you seven times more plagues according to your sins. Verse 24, then I also will walk, and then I also will walk contrary to you and I will punish you yet seven times for your sins. Verse 28, Verse 28, everybody look. Then I, I will also walk contrary to you in fury, and I, even I, will chasten you seven times for your sins. Okay, so, so here's what we're talking about. Now, the judgment that Ezekiel had prophesied, lying on his right side, lying on his left side, was how many years? 430 years. Now, we're going to give him credit for time served, right? You know, they do that to... You know, incarcerate people, punish people. Uh, you discipline them. I'm going to give you credit for time served. How much time should, how much credit should they get for time served? Seventy years. Seventy years. So how much is left of the judgment? Three hundred. They owe God 360 years. Now, according to Leviticus, if their hearts don't turn. And what was the one sin? The one sin that they continually committed that so infuriated God, so broke the heart of God. And that idolatry was displayed or manifest by what? Child sacrifice. Child sacrifice. Sacrificing their children to the god Molech. Nothing could be more offensive, more abhorrent, more of an abomination to God. I love babies. I don't know. I just, I love babies. When they become teenagers, that's another matter. But I love babies. <laughs> But there's life after the teen years. Make no mistake about that. You know, and it's life more abundantly. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, we won't go there. 149 people were where last Saturday? The abortion clinic. 149 people at the slaughterhouse in Greenville. There's only three abortion clinics in the state, right? Charleston, Columbia, Greenville. And only 149 Christians could show up, could, could sacrifice one, one morning, one day a year to stand against this abomination. Only 149 people. How many churches are there in Greenville County? How many people claim to be Christian in Greenville County? How many people were at the Clemson game Saturday? 80,000. Do you think we have our priorities straight? Or do you think we're a little messed up? A little, what do you say, Mike? Tuzi pots. Huh? A little crazy in the head. Right? So, seven times the judgment that's left. Right? Seven times the 360 years. So they owe God how much? 2,520 years. Now, go to the next slide. If you take the 2,520 years and, and multiply it by their calendar, their calendar was a 360-day year. Okay? You with me? So you got to multiply that out, and you come to 907,200 
days or years, excuse me. No, years, days, days. 907,200 days. Our year is a 365.25, right? So you divide that by the number of days specific, the 907,200, and you come up with 2483.8. Now, when did the time serve end? 535.3. Time serve ended, right? The first 70, 535.3. They still owe God 2483.8. So we go forward in time with they owe God, and you come to May 1948. Anything significant happened that day? May 14th, 1948. Judgment was over. Israel was a nation among the nations once again. We're, we're approaching the end of the times of the Gentiles. Isn't that fascinating to you? Yes. Or is this boring? No. no. How could the word of God ever be boring? But look at how exact and how specific our God is. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Any questions, comments? This will this all be on realm. <clears throat> No, <laughs> they don't practice the year of Jubilee. When, when, will, when will Israel practice the year of Jubilee? At the millennial reign of Christ. Yeah, yeah. Greed. That's always been the problem in the heart of man, isn't it? Greed, envy, selfishness, you know. But there's coming a day when, you know, if, if the rejection of the Messiah of Israel by his own people brought about the blessing to us, the Goyam, the Gentiles, if the rejection of God, of the Messiah, of Jesus, Yeshua, if the rejection of Yeshua brought such blessing to us as the Gentiles, Paul says, how much more so what? The restoration. When they, when they are restored back to God as coming back from the dead, right? Because Israel, for the most part, has been dead to God all these years. But God is going to revive them. He's going to awaken them. If you study through Romans 9, 10, and 11, you'll see. God is not through with Israel. Replacement theology, which is gaining such ground in, in, in our country and in, in the Baptist church today, is, it's, just, it's amazing to me, the stupidity, the foolishness. I said that uh, the rejection of God's truth will always lead you to madness, insanity, Right? Who, who displayed that insanity on Sunday's message? We're talking about the rejection of Jesus and how they displayed such madness. The Sadducees. Why? Because, because here was Lazarus raised from the dead and a multitude of eyewitnesses. Here Jesus performed a numeral, numeral, uh, more miracles than could be recorded according to John in the end as he ends his gospel. And yet they refuse to believe because they're wed to their, their own philosophy. They're wed to their ideology. They're wed to their power, drunk with it. And so what do they want to do? They want to kill Lazarus and Jesus. <laughs> the man's already died once. How can you threaten him with his life? He knows his life is eternal now. But you see the madness in that? The evidence is overwhelming that Jesus is who he said he was. But because of their wicked hearts and their bias, their evil hearts, the madness of Judas betraying innocent blood, last thing he would say, the madness in our world today. How does anything that's happening today in our nation make any sense whatsoever? Why did he make that midnight call on Monday night? Why? Who am I talking about? You don't know? Sleepy Joe. He wasn't sleeping Monday night. Who was Sleepy Joe talking to in the middle of the night? Xi Jinping. Why? Because they're old friends. Hello, my old friend. You know? Has a cat said to the mouse? Mm -hmm. You know why he called? You, you, need, you need to pursue other sources of news and information because what we get from the main media sources is, is lies distortions, their spin. We live in a very interesting time. For a long time, we decided to sacrifice Jewish blood for what? Aaron Boyle. And that's the decision we made. We, we purposed to allow the Jews to be slaughtered to win favor with the Arabs. 
didn't we? It's true. It's historic. We are going to sacrifice Taiwan. Now, it may, it may cause tremendous destruction in Japan and South Korea and in Australia, New Zealand possibly, because I think those nations have no choice but to try to defend Taiwan. Oh, my good friend Joe, let's work a deal. And I believe he dealt with the devil. Hmm? Why did I go there? Something applicable here. What? The world's upside down. The world's upside down, the insanity of it all, the craziness of it all, and how precise our God is. And he declared, and so, oh, you asked me if the Jews, if the Jews were still, uh, would they give the land its rest? No. Would they, would they celebrate the year of Jubilee? What, what happened on the year of Jubilee? What were you required to do? All the banks were to turn you, your deeds over to you and forgive your debt. <laughs> they, they'd run to do that, wouldn't they? Yeah. How, how does the... Do you see what gas was in California today? Huh? No, no, not that bad. Not that bad. It's getting there. A premium. Regular gas, California, uh, four seventy a gallon. Four seventy. They said it's gonna be five dollars before the holiday, before Thanksgiving and Christmas. Five dollars a gallon. I don't know what it'll be here. Did, have you seen the, the stickers on the fuel pumps? Yes. You know, there's a little sticker on the fuel pump that shows the prices, and it's a picture of Biden with his finger pointing, and he says, I did that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who's doing that, but I love it, you know. <laughs> All right, back to Daniel chapter 9. The preciseness of our God. Isn't he wonderful? Yeah. Hmm? yeah. Absolutely wonderful. And again, all this information that I just shared with you, it's, 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 it's so encouraging to see that our God is in complete and total control. It, it, nothing has ever been out of his control. I know there are times when any of, all of us have, have suffered and sorrowed, right? And you ask yourself, where are you in this God? Where are you? And I remember in some of those deepest and darkest times, he'd say, I'm exactly where I was the day my son was crucified. All things work together for good. All things. By the way, we went to court the other day. Pastor Darren and I, he's a lawbreaker. <laughs> but it wasn't for him. <laughs> no, it was it for me. It was for the woman who hit our building, you know. She was uh, intoxicated, and thank God she didn't get hurt. And so we went to court, and, and we had to wait a long time because she decided she was going to uh, request a court-appointed attorney and fight the charge. And um, fortunately, when the judge and the officer pulled her aside and said, those guys have it all on video. <laughs> <laughs> she, she's, Can we work a plea deal? <laughs> So she pleaded guilty, and uh, everything worked out just fine in our favor. And, and for hers, it significantly reduced her fine. But I said to her, I said, uh, Miss, uh, I won't tell your name. Miss so-and-so, I want you to know how happy we all are you never got hurt, that you weren't hurt at all. And I want you to know, ever since the day you hit our church, there's a multitude of people praying for you. And she almost wanted to break down crying, and she said, well, I'm in a recovery program, and I've been clean for 30 days, 30 days, you know? And, and, I, and she said, all of this may be for my good. Wow. And I said, that's exactly right. All things work together for good. Amen? Amen. 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 Yeah. So please, understand that. God's sovereignty is my sanity in such crazy times. So the only way to interpret what is taking place is from a spiritual perspective. But our God's in control. Daniel chapter 9. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood the books of the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord given through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So he knows this, this time period is just about over. Please, beloved, do you recognize we are at the end of the season of this world as we know it? For 2,000 years, we almost 2,000 years, Jesus taught us to pray, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, 
The church has been praying that for 2,000 years. Do you know that's happening right now? He, listen, what he's doing is the kingdoms of this world have to be destroyed and they will become the kingdoms of his Christ. The Lord's Christ, God's Christ. And so that prayer that we've been praying for almost 2,000 years is beginning to be realized. Thy kingdom come. Do you understand that? I hope you do. We are in the season of his return and there is a plethora, a plurality of signs to indicate that for us. We could gather together every night for a month and I wouldn't exhaust the number of signs to indicate the time that we're in. Time, singular, signs, plural. It's amazing. It is amazing. So Daniel recognized he was at the end of the, almost the end of the 70 years. And then I set my face, verse 3, towards the Lord God to make a request, my prayer, my supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. More than ever, we need to become a people of prayer, a church of prayer. Now, I know a lot of you do. And then, you know, we, we offer an opportunity every single day, twice a day, 7 a.m., 7 p.m. You can get on the prayer line. It always blesses my heart to hear your prayers. But every day, 7 a.m., 7 p.m., every single day, we're praying. And we're going to do that until the Lord returns, until he comes. Why? It, it's imperative that we do so. Why? Because these are the times that Paul wrote about. He said at the end times... Perilous times would come. Perilous. That word is only used one other place in Matthew's gospel talking about the demoniac that comes out of the tombs and the Gerdanis. It's, it's speaking of demonic force. Perilous times, demonic force and influences. Is that not our day? The crime, the lawlessness, the insanity of people. It's, it's demonically driven. Perilous times, kalepos, demonic. So, it, it's the, like Daniel, we need to pray. Maybe we should pick a day. I mean, I'm not that, you know, I'm going to do that for the whole church, but maybe each of us individually, singularly, should pick a day to a fast. And pray. And make our petitions unto God. Now, now, you need to pray long enough to where you start what? Pray. Really praying. You see, sometimes our, our, our... I'm not happy with my prayer life. Are you happy with your prayer life? No, it's pitiful. I'm asking God to make me more of a man of prayer than ever before. I, I want to pray long enough where I really truly begin to pray in the spirit, where the spirit of God is moving me to pray those things. He would have me to pray because he's going to answer those things. He puts them in our heart, and then he provides the answer. And what does it do? Increases and strengthens our faith, right? It doesn't get any better than that, does it? No, no. <laughs> so, Lord, please make us a church of praying people, Lord, more than ever before. Like Daniel. Now, Daniel was in the administration of all of the previous governments, the Babylonians, the Medo Persian, for how many years? At least, probably close to 70 years, he was in the administration of the Babylonian and the Medo Persian kingdoms, empires. A very important man. But at the same time, he understood who he was. The best of men? Our men at best. And look at how he has humbled himself. You know, it's always a wonderful thing. It's a beautiful thing. It's, it really is a, an amazing thing when a man of power and influence is humble. Very rare commodity today, isn't it? Daniel, how humble he was. And I prayed to the Lord my God, and I made confession and said, O oh Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant with and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments. Now, that, that's all true because God does expect a certain behavior once we have become his child, right? You're not free to do whatever you want to do. God isn't giving you that. And the Bible certainly doesn't afford you that luxury. Oh, there's a lot of apostate churches that'll tell you, you can, you know, you can come to the Lord, come forward at this altar call, right? This one huge sacrament and you're guaranteed salvation. Is that true? No. Now, as a former Catholic, you know, we had uh, a number of sacraments we had to obey in order to have that hope of salvation, but you never had an assurance. But in, in evangelicalism, especially in America, we tell the whole world, all you got to do is perform one sacrament, and you perform this one sacrament, and you're sealed, saved, and delivered forever. What's that sacrament? The altar call. That's a new invention within Christianity. I want you to know that. 
what it has led to is a, is a tremendous number of people entering into a false sense of spiritual security. No, no, no. The evidence of my salvation, the evidence of my justification is my sanctification, my transformed life. When the angel released Peter from prison, he said, now go, go share this life of yours. And that's what we're supposed to display to the world. I'm a changed man. I was once one way, and now I'm another. I was Lazarus, I was dead, and now I'm alive. What's the difference? I met him. That should be everybody's testimony. But are you really living that way where people are asking you the question, you know, what makes you so different? What makes you tick? What are you all about? Now, I've had a number of people over the years that I had a conversation with that have to say, based upon the evidence or the lack of fruit, there is no reason for me to believe salvation has ever occurred in your life. And they'll say, how dare you? I went forward and blah, 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 blah. I said, I don't care what you did. I don't see any evidence of the Holy Spirit at work in your life. The only thing I can conclude is that I need to bring you to the cross. And then they either humble themselves, submit themselves, and beg for God's mercy and grace, or they go out the door mad because somebody else told them, you can live any way you want and still be saved. Is that true? That is the lie, that you can live any way. You can live like hell and have the assurance of heaven. That is not in the Bible. So you've got to tell people that lovingly. Because there's a world of people that believe that. Rob Bell, love wins. What is he proposing? That you can, you can believe anything you want, and you're still going to be saved because God doesn't condemn anybody. Now, where do you get that in the Bible? You can be a Hindu. You can be an atheist. You can be agnostic. You can be a Muslim. You can be anything you want, and, and you're still going to be saved because God's love is greater. God's love is great. But God himself has chosen there is but one way. And that way is Jesus. And all who would enter in that way will live a transformed life, a changed life. You won't be the same person. You can't be. And if you try to be, you'll be miserable. Well, you, come on. You, right? Mm. Yes, he keeps covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments. For we have sinned. Look at how he's, he's identified. You know, who's not sinned? Jesus. <laughs> yeah, Jesus, Jesus is the only one who hasn't sinned. Even, even his mother Mary needed a savior, right? That's how she referred to him. And we have sinned and committed iniquity and we have done wickedly and rebelled even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. So he's admitting all of this is happening. That's why the time seven. Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes, to our fathers and all of the people of the land. And Jesus would say to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, which of the prophets that I've sent to you have you not killed? killed. They killed them all. Why? They hated the prophets? Hated the message. What was the message? Turn or burn. Hey, repent. No, no, no. It was, it was the, listen, to sum it up very simply, but they did it, is turn or burn. That's your choice. Change your life. Oh, I can't. I can't change my life, right? What I can do is humble myself, submit myself to God, and allow the Holy Spirit to change me. Allow the Holy Spirit, the person of Christ, the, the Spirit of Christ, to live his life through me. That's, listen, that's living the Christian life. You humble yourself and allow the Holy Spirit to overshadow you the way he overshadowed Mary and she conceived. And you'll conceive of a new life. She made a baby. You'll make a new life. Isn't it wonderful? Verse 7, O Lord, Righteousness belongs to you, but to us shame of face as it is this day. To the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, to all of Israel, those near and those far off in the countries which you have driven them because of the unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. O Lord, to us belongs shame of face to our kings, our princes, our fathers, because we have sinned against you. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Is that true? How many might all be? Hmm. And to the Lord our God belongs mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. That's the good news, isn't it? 
Yeah. Abounding in mercy and love. For we have not obeyed, verse 10 now, we have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his ways, which he has set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yes, all Israel has transgressed your law and has departed as not to obey your voice. Therefore, the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, Leviticus 26, the servant of God has been poured out on us because we have sinned against him. But you see how Daniel is not excluding himself. He's identifying with all of this, isn't he? If we got what we deserve, what should we get? Hell. Hell. Hell, condemnation. That's what we deserve. How many of you not end the day by asking God to forgive you of whatever it might be? I, I know before I get out of bed in the morning. There's something I'm going to think, some way I'm going to react. Which of us are not in need of his mercy every single day? That's why it's, Lamentations tells us it's what? New every morning. New, new in type, new in quantity, new in kind. Why? Because we're so desperately in need. Hmm? <laughs> yes, all Israel has transgressed your law and has departed as not to obey your voice. Therefore, the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, has been poured out upon us because we have sinned against him. And he has confirm, confirmed his words, which you spoke against us and against our judges who judge us by bringing upon us a great disaster for under the whole heavens such never has been done as what's been done to Jerusalem. Totally, complete destruction by the Babylonians as it is written in the law of Moses. All this disaster has come upon us, yet we have not made our prayer before our God, the Lord our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand the truth. Now, the, the gate is going to be open for Israel to return back to the Lord. And that manifestation of the return back to the Lord is that they will go back to Israel and rebuild the city, rebuild the temple. And when that happened, when Cyrus read the scroll of Isaiah and saw his name written in the scroll of Isaiah 150 years before he was even born, that's amazing, isn't it? How precise is our God? Oh, by the way, the man who's going to release you to go back and rebuild the city and the nation. His name is Cyrus, my servant. Can you imagine that? He said, I better let you guys go. Get out of here. Go, go, go. How many left? How many? 49,000. Less than 50,000. Less than 50,000 Jews left Babylon to go back to Israel and rebuild the nation and the city. A remnant. It's a remnant of a remnant. The majority, overwhelming majority of them stayed in Babylon. Why? Life was good. Business was good. The pleasures of Babylon, the prosperity, the abundance, the business opportunity. Wow, all my flesh desires could be fulfilled, could be realized in Babylon. Why would I leave? And God says to the church today, come out from among them, my people. Be separate. I will be your God. You will be, come out from where? The world, the culture. Listen, make no mistake about it. From everything I understand about the Bible, I'm, in, I'm late, huh? I've got to close. 40 years I've been studying Bible prophecy. There, there's no end times revival in the Bible. There's an end times apostasy. Every measurable indicator that we're in the end times is here. And what that means is the culture is lost. Do you not recognize the short of God's intervention, short of God intervening in a very powerful way, this culture is lost. It's gone. And the next generation, I mean, they are, they are gone. They're out of their minds. Woke. And as I told the men on Sunday, listen, Every man, every head of every household, you need to do everything you can. You need to double down to save your family. Save your soul. Take heed. Look how many times in the New Testament we're given the admonition, take heed, take heed, take heed. Stop playing fast and loose with your salvation. There's a lot of churches that will afford you that nonsense. This isn't one of them. Some days you'll want to go out of here with your hair on fire. I'm going to tell you the truth. The whole truth, but the truth will help me, God. Because that's what you need to hear. You can't dance with this world. 
and expect to, find, to have the approval of God. It's just not going to happen. He's not some toothless grandfather that you come to and ask anything you want, no matter how you behave, and you're going to get it. Mm -mm. It doesn't work that way. Okay, uh, we'll end here, because next time we gather together, I'm going to show you another series of prophecies, and we'll do the math, and it's absolutely mind-blowing. It's fascinating. The preciseness of our God. So what did you get out? All right, what did you get out of tonight's teaching for you? Tell me. The comfort of order and what? Orderliness and chaos. Yes, yes. The comfort of his orderliness, his control in the chaos in which we live. Yeah. Yes, how secure we are. And, and you want to know him more and more and more. You need to spend more time than ever before in the word of God, knowing Jesus. Like Mary, sitting in... Listen, you're Lazarus, right? Sunday's message. You're Lazarus. Every one of us are Lazarus. We were dead, but now we're alive. And, and now we sit at his feet and learn of him, worship him. And as a result, we get up and like Martha, what do we do? Serve. serve. That's right, serve. Yeah. Anybody else? It's always good for me to hear what you get out of this. He's a God of purpose. He's a God of purpose. Very intentional, isn't he? Yeah, nothing by happenstance. No, no, no. You were saved. You were brought into the kingdom. You were giving life as his child for a very specific purpose. Have you discovered what it is? Where's Levi? Levi. I think you're the youngest among us this evening. And you have a hunger for God's word, don't you? And God's got a purpose and a plan for your life. Your adventure now is to discover who you are in the will of God. You know, Paul would write over and over again, the great apostle. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. It wasn't his desire. It wasn't his desire. He was working against God, wasn't he? His desire was to become a very powerful, influential man in Israel, one of the rich Pharisees. But God had another plan for him. Parents, grandparents, you, you, the wonderful privilege that you have and joy is to study your children. Right, Zach? Study your children and discover who they are in the will of God, what idiosyncrasies he's given them in talents, in gifts, in temperament, in personality, all of that God put in them for a very specific purpose in the way he wants to use them. You can't live your life vicariously through them. Too many parents try to do that, especially they want all their kids to become professional athletes or doctors or lawyers. <laughs> no, let your child discover and you help them do that. Let them discover who they are in God's will. And then once they do, life doesn't get any better than that. You, you know exactly what you were created for, where you have come from, what you're to do, and where you're returning to. Isn't that wonderful? When you know that? Mm. That's, a, that's a parent's job. That's a grandparent's job. That's, that's anybody who has influence over children. Your, your job is to encourage them to discover who it is they are. Not in their parents' will, not in their own will, in God's will. And so many adults don't know that. Who are you in the will of God? Amen. 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 Terry, you got a closing song? Shall we stand?